Hope you're hanging in there. There's more to come. And uh, Nick is, is a wonderful bridge between our morning sessions, our amazing morning sessions, with, uh, with a, a Senior Vice Chancellor Mary Ludden, uh, and she is also a Senior Vice Provost. Then we had the, the uh, pop-in visit from the uh, Vice President of, the, of Global Services, Malik uh, Sandaram. That was followed by Professor Terry Mugen and uh, the surprise uh, guest, uh, Professor Mary Yoko Brannan, and our most recent speaker today, Professor Julia Ivey, will be rejoining us after Nick's presentation uh, to set up the afternoon interactive workshops. Now, Nick Dimitrov is no stranger to the Northeastern campus. He arrived here back in the 1990s as a student, which he will tell you, and he has become involved with the Northeastern global system uh, in more recent years, and he's a very loyal and generous alum and an amazing person. Welcome, Nick Dimitrov. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Dimitrov. I uh, am uh, a Northeastern alum, as Professor Puffer shared. I actually graduated this uh, university as an undergraduate student in business administration more than 20 years ago. And uh, in uh, my talk today, I will touch on two themes. The first one would be sharing with you some of the highlights of my story as an international student. I'm going to show some pictures to you that are going to highlight some of those steps. Because back in the day, I was on the other side of this podium. I was on the other side of the Zoom call. I was in your chair sitting proverbially. And uh, the goal of that first part of the presentation would be just to acknowledge what you're going through and to share with you how amazing you are and how challenging what you're going through is and to let you know that you're not alone. So that would be one. And then secondly, the second part of today's talk would be mostly pragmatic. I will share with you very concrete one, two, three tactical steps of uh, what you can do in order to be hired by companies which practice behavioral interviewing techniques. And pretty much those companies are all over the world. They're in America, they're overseas. All of Silicon Valley does it, you know, the FAM companies do it, so on and so forth. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, so on and so forth. So hopefully that's going to be useful for all of you because that's my goal, to help, particularly the international students in the audience. <laughs> so let's start with the international picture story, international student picture story. So I came to the U.S. in 1995. That's... Uh, a long time ago, and just to set context, in 1995, there was no such thing as uh, um, Gmail, <laughs> for example, right? Just, for you, just, just let that sink in. There was no such thing as an iPhone. Um, there were no computers. Uh, to, for you to imagine, there were such few computers that Northeastern had computer labs because <laughs> people didn't have enough computers on them. Um, there was you know, some email, but in Bulgaria, there definitely was not, there, there, was, there, there was no email. So um, lots of, a lot of you most likely weren't even born in 1995. So that's when I came to the U.S. And uh, I had just turned 20, and this is how I looked like. Um, and, uh, but more importantly than what I looked like, this, is, this was how my student F1 visa looked like. And that was a very valuable document for me. And... Um, as you might see, uh, it is uh, typed on a typewriter, uh, not a computer. I'm sure it was an electric typewriter, uh, top of the line, I'm sure. And um, you can also see the cost of my Northeastern education for, um, uh, for one year was uh, $24,000, ballpark. And you can also see maybe at the bottom that I was uh, very fortunate to be given a scholarship by Northeastern that covered part of that cost. But because of the change in the difference in the standard of living between Bulgaria and the United States, uh, the, the amount was still 
impossible to cover, you, you know, even with the scholarship included. So what my parents did, and I still don't know to this day how they did it, is they either sold or mortgaged everything they had, and they collected enough money for that very first quarter at Northeastern. Northeastern used to be able to allow you to, to just pay quarterly. Um, I don't know if that's still the case. And uh, they also gave me a few hundred dollars on top to, uh, for me to live on in, the, in America, and they just sent me out. So, so here I was, I got, into, got to Logan, got into a taxi cab from Logan to 360 Huntington Avenue, and that taxi cab might as well have been a time machine um, because through its windows, I saw just phantasmagorical things. I saw skylines and skyscrapers and towers, which I had never even thought existed, and I was so pumped. And I stepped out of the taxi cab, and then reality hit me. It was, uh, boom, welcome to America, Nick Dimitrov, right? Everything broke. And uh, what that meant in particular was I found out that I was here too early and the dorms were closed. So I had nowhere to sleep and I had to go to a hotel. And if I were to use my money, which is the only money I had, the few hundred dollars, I would run out of that money in about less than two weeks. So I was despondent. I was, I was walking in a daze um, across campus and I stumbled upon this device, which is a payphone, for those of you who don't know. And uh, I uh, had no uh, coins on me or no calling card, but I still wanted to hear a similar voice, uh, a familiar voice, sorry. Wanted to hear my, the, the voice of my parents. And I had watched enough American movies to know that you can call someone collect. So I called them collect in the middle of the night their time. I, God knows how much that must have cost them. And I just wanted to, to, to hear them say hi, you know, to hear them say my name. I felt, I'm sure I must have cried during that phone call, and, and I felt worse after the phone call. But um, during that phone call, for a very short amount of time, uh, it, 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 I wanted to connect with something familiar. So I know that a lot of international students, a lot of you in the room, a lot of you on Zoom, must be going through similar emotions, maybe. And, and it's very hard, it's very lonely. It's, um, it's very challenging to effectively reset who you are. And some of the speakers uh, earlier today talked about this. I, I had to effectively reset the odometer of my mind and of my knowledge, if I were a car. And uh, you know, in my, <laughs> my rich 20-year-old Bulgarian immigrant brain had to go, poop, you know, start from zero now. And, uh, and that's very, very challenging. And the way I knew how to deal with it was to walk around the streets of Boston with this device right here. And for those of you who don't know, that's a cassette tape recorder that you can use to record your voice. And as I said again, there was no email back in the day, at least between Bulgaria and the United States. So I literally would send voicemails, well, voice letters. Um, and I would record the full tape. I would put it in an envelope. I would lick it shut, put it in the mail. It would take a month to go uh, to Bulgaria and then another month to come back. And, uh, and I would, it, that, that's, that's how I would try to process all this information that was, um, that was completely new to me and, and to build this brand new identity. And um, in those voice tapes, what my brilliant mind, the 20 year old brilliant mind could think of was that I shared, one of the things was that I shared with my parents that there were two things, that only two things that the great cultures of the United States, on the one hand, and Bulgaria had in common. Just two things. I don't know if you can guess, but one of those two things, the first one, was the slop sign. And, uh, of course, little did I know I had no dr driver's license then that uh, um, there's such a thing as a four-way stop sign. And uh, Bulgaria does not have a four-way stop sign, so that was, <laughs> that, was, that was not a very good analogy. And the second thing that the two cultures had in common uh, was the tomato. And uh, it just imagine how, again, if you go back to, to Terry's and Julia's talks this morning, I was functioning at that very early stage of not even communicating, not even socializing and integrating myself. It was just basically awareness and, and language and, 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 uh, and knowing what surrounds you. It was, it was that hard. And effectively, I not only had to worry about having 
good academics and keeping my grades up, otherwise I'd lose my ambassador scholarship, I had to worry about, about everything else. And I would wake up in the morning and I didn't know how I'd make it until the end of the day because everything was brand new. Uh, and I had to worry about everything else other than tomatoes and stop signs. And uh, I had these massive encounters for me, which for locals would be, would be a joke, but I, you know, for example, I would um, encounter this contraption, which is a coin-operated laundry, mu laundry machine. And uh, I've never worked with one before because you don't see in American movies uh, instructions on how to use one of these. So what I literally had to do is I waited until I ran out of all my clean clothes. And then uh, in the dead of night, in the middle of the week, I um, went in the basement of uh, the uh, dorm where, I, where, where, the, where the laundry machines were. Well, there was nobody else around. And I took that beast by the horns and I, and I, and I figured out how to, how to do laundry. Um, so these types of clashes, cultural clashes, they happen daily. And they not only happen with objects, but as you can imagine, they happen with people, too. And uh, the very first time I went to a fast food place, I uh, wanted to treat myself, because all I could afford was a value meal, you know, once a week, outside of the, 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 the dorm food, of course. And, uh, and I walk in there, and I wait in line, and I come up to the front of the line, and I make, and I place my order, and I hear the question from the cashier, for here or to go? And I have no idea what that means. <laughs> and uh, initially, he thought I hadn't heard. Then he thought I was pranking him. Then he got really upset and started exaggerating and almost yelling at me for here or to go. And I understood, but I was still confused. What kind of restaurant would sell you food and then ask you to leave? <laughs> what, what kind of country was this? Um, so I, I, I said, you know, for here, and, and the drama was resolved. But, but you get the point. That type of culture clashing happens on micro level over and over and over again for a lot of folks who, who come uh, overseas, from overseas. Um, and um, I, was, I was walking. I was walking and thinking about these things, and this is one of the many routes that they all originated in around 360 Huntington Avenue from Northeastern. And in this particular route, I'd go all the way to as far as I could walk feasibly uh, to, uh, to the harbor, to some, one of the piers, and I would sit down at a bench there, and I would reread the handwritten letters that my mother would send me, um, and then I'd look at the sun, thinking that, hey, you know, I'm sure they share the same sun, even though maybe not at the same time, but, um, but that's, that's, that's a, that was a very real experience for me, and it's very, very hard. It's, it, it, it's, those are challenges that it's hard to, to explain to people who are native to the culture uh, that you join. And again, the, the, underscore, the underscoring message here in, in, that, in that first half of my, of my chat is that you are important, that you matter, and uh, that this country is lucky to have you. And uh, I want to uh, end, the, the final picture on these slides is, is going to be a, a bit more of an optimistic picture. Um, in an optimistic story. Um, this, is, uh, this is a CD, for those of you who don't know. I know I'm resetting your odometers right now for a lot of you. Um, this, is a, this was a song that one of my professors played for the whole class. And the song is called Conte Partiro. The uh, English name of it is Time to Say Goodbye. And, uh, and I'll spoil the surprise a bit. I'll share with you that this professor is in this room with us. Um, it's Professor Sheila Puffer. I'm sure she might have forgotten about this instance, but I will never forget for the rest of my days. And the reason why this, this song touched me so deeply was because in the song, it's performed by Andrea Bocelli, who's Italian, and Sarah Brightman, who's English. And they alternate singing in Italian and then in English. And then even more potently, they flip then Bocelli, who's Italian, sings a, an English stanza, and Brightman, who's English, sings something in Italian. And you can clearly say, you can clearly acknowledge that um, they have their accents and they have their imperfections, but the song is better because they're in it and because they're communicating in a way that is inclusive 
and, uh, and that makes the song more full because of it. And you should also know that this country is better, this Northeastern University is better because you're in it. Um, and uh, sometimes that might get lost on you, but I think your future selves, if you have the fortitude to keep going and pushing on, your future selves are gonna thank you for what you've gone through and what you're going through right now. So that's, uh, that was the emotional part of my talk. And now um, let's flip to the more pragmatic one. It's time to pay some bills. Um, and this is uh, gonna be me sharing with you how to interview effectively in a behavioral interview fashion. So this, these next 30 minutes or so are gonna be helpful for you. If you are currently applying for a job or thinking to apply for a job at some point, hopefully you are, and, uh, and or if you wanna just improve how you interview behaviorally. Maybe you currently have a co-op job and you, you feel like a million bucks and that's great. But, um, but hopefully these skills are gonna help you become even more um, effective going forward. So, so what I can promise you is that in the next 30 minutes, um, this is going to be useful information. You're not going to look at each other by the end of the talk and think like, what was this guy talking about? He was just moving here. Um, this is going to be tactical and proven. And there's no gimmicks. I'm not going to ask you to buy anything. Um, this is just for your benefit. So the the steps are, I'm going to share with you who Amazon Bound is, what Amazon Bound is, and what makes me qualified to give you this, um, this presentation. And then we're going to go through two steps of how to interview effectively. First one is going to be a high level, and then we're going to go deep and tactical, because that's what matters. You got to have skills. Um, and I'm going to actually role play an interview response for you, and you're going to choose which one, which interview response you'll make me role play for you. And then we're going to have a raffle. Um, not only am I not going to ask you to pay for anything, I'm going to give you free stuff. But you got to be here until the end of the day to be eligible for the raffle. Okay, so this is who I am. I um, was incredibly fortunate to graduate Northeastern University with my Bachelor of uh, Science in Business Administration um, diploma. Then I joined Microsoft, uh, and then after that I joined Amazon for a combined roughly 20 years between the two companies. I was at Amazon for five years, give or take. I was fortunate to join them in 2013 when they were a very tiny company at the time. Um, they were not the Amazon of today. Their market cap was lower than Adobe's market cap or Caterpillar's market cap today, if you can believe that. And, uh, and I was also very fortunate to be one of the first four people, one of four people who presented to Bezos himself and convinced him to get into the game space, the video game space. And uh, Amazon started Amazon Game Studios, and um, they've acquired Twitch since then. They have had investments in game uh, technology, in, in game engines, in, uh, in first-party games. And um, side by side, and by the way, my function there was a technical principal in uh, product management and business development. So side by side with my function, I was a bar raiser at Amazon. Bar raisers are very briefly, those are people who have the outsized authority to determine who the company would hire. They're given the key to the city, and they're given an inordinate amount of power. So I was one of those folks who determined the fates of more than 350 interview candidates at Amazon. And, uh, but then I left the company in 2018. <coughs> Excuse me. Left the company in 2018 because I'm an immigrant. I've always had this irrational desire to build. And uh, as... Uh, successful as a career as I had. At the time at Amazon, I, you got to follow your heart. And I started a company called Amazon Bound. It's a company that helps consumers, customers like all of us, interview effectively with um, corporations that practice behavioral interview skills and techniques. And Amazon's one of them. Again, you can go through the gamut, Airbnb, Uber, Facebook, on and on and on. All those folks, Microsoft, they practice behavioral interviewing in one capacity or another. So this is what Amazon Bound is. This is their website. And um, I'm happy to share that our, the success rate of our customers is six times higher than the average person who interviews with Amazon. And uh, we have thousands of customers from all over the world. There's a lot of, a lot of customers from Asia, uh, not surprisingly. So ready to jump in. 
as I said, let's start at a high level and show you the what, the step-by-step -step strategy to prepare and ace the behavioral interview. So a lot of these companies are gonna ask you what they call behavioral questions. And behavioral questions are, tell me a time you did X, tell me a case you did Y. And they're looking for very concrete answers of what you've done in your prior career or education. For those of you who don't have co-ops or whatnot, education project examples work just as well. And these companies believe that unlike stocks, for people, past performance is a future indicator of, uh, is a good indicator for future performance. So what um, they use is they use the so-called behavioral questions, which are aligned with their culture. And these companies, they have various different cultures that they're very public about. And um, they're gonna ask you these questions. Roughly 60, 70, 80% of the interview is gonna be based on behavioral questions. So the, what, what you should do to prepare uh, for, for these questions is study what these companies' values are. They're very, as I said, public about it. A lot of them call them leadership principles. A lot of them call them values. They're very, they, they tend to be in a different level of detail, like Amazon has 16 leadership principles that are very concrete. Google has, I think, five, and they're somewhat squishier, like one of them is, for instance, Googliness. I mean, how do you define Googliness? But, but they're very, very uh, transparent about what these leadership principles are. So study those principles ahead of time, and then list your, I, I say, 25 accomplishments and failures. Um, you know, the more you can list, the better. The reason why you need uh, a double digit number of accomplishments and failures is because you're gonna be interviewed by a loop of people, by a loop of maybe five people. And each of them are gonna ask you for 45, 60 minutes, they're gonna ask you uh, five or six questions each. Now for, for student candidates, they are a little bit more lenient, so maybe it's not gonna be five people, it's gonna be maybe three or four, but, but it's good to be overprepared. So, um, so list those accomplishments and failures ahead of time. And, um, and match them to the LPs that they illustrate the best. And there's a many-to-many -many relationship between accomplishments and leadership principles. You're gonna have this matrix, this mesh, once you're done with it, between the column of leadership principles and the column with, with your accomplishments. And then once you create this mesh, and also it's important to create a mesh because you wanna make sure that every one of their leadership principles you have illustrated with a sufficient number of accomplishments. You don't want to be light on any of those, any of those important value systems for them. Um, and then once you, once you uh, prepare that, that mesh, that matrix, you should unpack each of your accomplishments in a behavioral format, which um, I suggest you start by writing it out just to learn how to do it. If you have enough time, if you, and, if you, and if you're a writer, by gosh, right, 25 pages, you know, that you're gonna be unstoppable during the interview. But if, if you don't have the time, just, just do two or three or four, learn the mental structure, and then do the rest out loud in front of the mirror as you're practicing. So how, how, are, you gonna, how are you gonna structure these one pagers or one and a half pagers? Use the SOAR framework. It's, it stands for Situation, Obstacle, Action, Result. A lot of people talk to it as, as the STAR framework, the same thing. Uh, instead of obstacle, um, the word there is, is task. I like obstacle much more because it's more proactive instead of task, which you manage, it gives you. And, uh, and there's, there's, there's treasure trove of information online, free of uh, how to prepare for STAR and what STAR is. But essentially, situation is the context. Here's who I was, here's my title, here's what the company does, here's my brief description of the responsibilities that I had. Task or obstacle is here's what was broken, here's why it was painful, here's how much it cost us. Action is what are the steps you took to fix the problem? One, two, three, very concrete, lots of data, as Julia mentioned earlier. The more data you can give them, the better. Just kill them with data. That's what they care for. And then results is, and what was the outcome of your actions? And again, it needs to be quantifiable. How much money did you save the company? How much money did you make incrementally in terms of revenue? It needs to be very, very concrete. So if you do that, you would be ready for uh, about 80% of your interview, anywhere from 60 to 80% of the interview. Now, for the rest of the interview, they're gonna ask you what they call functional competency questions. 
And those are role-playing questions. Those are effectively your line of business subject matter expertise questions. If you are an accountant, they're going to ask you to create a T account. If you're a marketer, they're going to say, hey, give me a go-to-market strategy. If you are an engineer, they're going to ask you to code something. They, they would want to see um, how good you are at your craft. Now, these questions are important as well. I don't want to belittle how important these questions are, but they're decidedly sec of secondary importance to the leadership principles slash behavioral questions. These companies are going to determine whether to hire you or not based on your leadership principles fit. And once they make that determination, they will decide what team and what capacity and what uh, role and what time frame based on the functional questions. The opposite is not true. You can be an excellent subject matter expert. You can crunch numbers like the rest of them, like nobody else. But, uh, but if you're not a cultural fit, they're not going to hire you. Frequently, a lot of these companies have master's programs where they would make you a blanket offer if you're a good culture fit. They would put you through a co-op, and they'd say, great, now that this person is a good fit, we're going to hire him. We promise you, six months down the line, you're going to be an Amazonian. And they don't even know what team they're going to put you on because they don't care. Because functional is fungible. It, it's teachable. Um, now, I'm not saying uh, ignore this part of the interview, but, um, but, but, but it's less important than the behavioral fit. So the way, the way you get ready for this part is, is it's, less, it's somewhat more nebulous than, than the behavioral side because behavioral side, as I mentioned, you've done it. On this side, it's, it, it's hard to figure out what question they could ask you because the universe of potential questions is unlimited. So the way you do it is you can you know, go online and, and crunch through things like Quora and Glassdoor and look through examples of others who have recently posted um, and questions that they've heard for that particular vein of either program manager or whatever, or accountant online, and, and, and pretend what would you do if you were in their shoes. And the key to, to keep in mind here is, um, before, before I talk about the key, also practice on Pramp.com. It's a, it's a good resource. It's completely free. For those of you who are more technical, what Pramp does is it matches you up with somebody. They, they do a quick survey. They find out about where your uh, competency lies, and then they match you with someone else like you up here at a, at a similar level of competency. And then, and then they hook you up for a two-hour video call, and then you take turns interviewing each other for an hour. So, so that's, a, that's, a good, that's a, another good place for you to practice. So once you, um, once you practice and once you go through a few, um, once you go through a few sample role-playing questions that you see, a mental structure to prepare for these is time matters. Give yourself no more than three, four, five minutes to think of an answer and then give the answer in order to, in order to simulate the experience, in order to, to develop the muscle memory. Don't, don't spend half an hour, an hour thinking of an answer because that, that's not what you're going to encounter. And uh, the element of surprise is important. And don't be afraid to be wrong, as Julia mentioned earlier. Wrong, being wrong is okay. They're not out there to get you. They're not out there to say, ha, I had a number, I had the number seven in my brain and you said the number six. I'm not gonna hire you. No. They're there to see if you're open to take risks. They're there to see if you're comfortable with ambiguity and getting uh, out of your, uh, getting out of your comfort zone. And, and if you're an international student, you've done it a million times. You know, you, you walk up to a laundry machine and you look like, and you feel like a, like a fool and you give it a try, and, you, and you're wrong over and over and over again, but that doesn't matter. You eventually will succeed. So those, those skills would come very handy in this scenario as well. So that's what you do for the functional side of things. And if you, um, if you, follow, if you follow up the, the behavioral steps, which I suggested, you should be in, in a fine shape to do well during your behavioral interview. Okay, now, um, we're shifting gears to the second part, which is the more, techn the more um, tactical part. Of, uh, of, uh, of my talk. We will role play with real interview questions. What do you want me to do in front of you? So the first question is, tell me your professional story. And you, and you can choose which one you want me to do. And we can tally up the votes on Zoom and we can have a show of hands here, one, two, three. The first one is tell me your professional story. Everybody's gonna ask you that question at the, at the beginning of the interview. So it's a good idea to know how to answer this question. The second one is, why do you want to work for us? Why do you want to be a, an Amazonian? 
And you have, better have a good answer for that. And the third one is, what's your biggest professional failure? There, so the second question you're going to hear out of a, the team of five, maybe, maybe two people are going to ask you that. The biggest professional failure or a failure, you're going to like hear maybe one or two people ask you that as well because failures demonstrate the leadership principles of certain companies better than accomplishments do. That's why it's important to have a subset of failures prepared as well. All right. So with that context out of the way, which one of these three you find people want me to um, simulate for you? Number three. Okay. Three. Any, any other votes? Number two. Two. Okay. We have two threes. One, two. Do we have a way to, um, to count the votes online? Three. 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 Three, okay, we have three, three, okay. So hopefully the Zoom audience is okay with us doing three. <laughs> All right, biggest professional failure. Here's what you should do. You should own your failure and you should quantify it. Don't be, um, don't be afraid to admit that you failed. And don't point fingers. Say it was my fault. I messed up, and it did hurt, and it cost us whatever, $50,000 in additional vendor spend. Or if you're a student, we got the D in the class, and we look like fools, and it was on me. And it's a failure that needs to hurt. It can be, oh, I was just embarrassed in a meeting, and then I walked out 40 minutes later and everybody forgot. It needs to, it needs to be a failure that hurts. Um, and then you move on and you give another example. You list the stories and the lessons you've learned from this failure. And you provide a separate example where you use those lessons in order to achieve success. And then you quantify that success as well. And again, you can do all of this in the star format, as I had mentioned earlier. And hopefully the the nested sore, as I call it, the, the follow-up success sore, hopefully the, the outcome of that, the quantifiable outcome, is bigger than the, than the failure outcome, but that's okay if it isn't. The, the important thing is, there's, there's four, important, four important points. One, you own the failure. Two, you quantify the failure. Three, you list your lessons. And four, you come up with another nested success story where you used your lessons in order to, to achieve an, a win. So that's what you do. What you don't do, is uh, any of these things. You don't beat yourself up. As I said earlier, you say, hey, it was my fault and it hurt, and then you stop. You don't just beat a horse and, uh, and deprecate yourself. Also, you don't say that you don't have a big failure. That's a big, that's a big red, red flag. So for me as a bar raiser, if somebody tells me, oh, I don't have a big failure, or say that my biggest failure is something um, that really wasn't a failure, that would, that would raise the flag on a bunch of leadership principles for me. I would say, well, maybe this person is resting investing. Maybe they're not pushing themselves for bias for action or ownership or high standards or learn to be curious or invent and simplify, on and on and on. Um, or again, if, if you do something small that is, that's trivial, if you say, hey, I, I forgot to make enough copies for a presentation for you know, Professor Swayze's class, I, I mean, that, that's not, I mean, fine, that's, that's, that's a decent failure, but it's not your biggest professional failure. You, you have to, again, think, it, it's okay to have multiple smaller failures. If you say, hey, I'm a student, I'm, I'm doing my master's degree, and I can give you three smaller failures, is that okay, instead of one big one? They would love you for it. If you, if you give them, again, more behavioral information and more data to help them in, uh, uh, build an informed opinion about you based on data, they, they, would, they would love you for it. But, again, just make sure that it's as, as meaty as possible. There, now, now we're talking a good failure. There you go. So let me, um, let me role play this. So what I would do to, um, when, when, when I hear a question like this would be something along those lines. Where do I start? I've made a, a bunch of mistakes, um, and to a large extent, I, I think these mistakes help us. A significant mistake I made recently is the lead TPM for product ABC was failing to launch the product on time for Christmas 2019. And uh, specifically, this is what I did wrong. One, two, three, right? And you do the SOAR format. And it, and it was very painful. And that one, was, that one was on me. 
and uh, it cost us $14 million in lost revenue. And then the top three lessons I learned from this was, were one, two, three. And with these lessons in tow, a year later, I launched the second version of product ABC. And uh, it was done on time and on budget this time. And as a result, we generated $27.5 million in revenue. Right? That is the ideal format of, um, of, a, of a sore failure response. So what I'm, what I'm doing here, if you can see it on, on, this, on this screen, is I'm highlighting in parentheses and, and an orange tint the, the structural pieces of this, of this response, right? So again, as you, if you recall, there's four building blocks. It, at first, say, hey, a significant mistake I made was such and such, and it was on me, and it did hurt. So what I do there is I quantify the mistake, and I claim ownership for it. And then at the bottom, at the, in the third and final paragraph, I say the top three lessons I learned were one, two, three, and I, I, I used them to ship something that was wonderful and it cost, and it, uh, and it helped the company generate a lot of revenue. Okay, so that was the tactical part of things. And uh, next, I'd like to briefly announce the raffle and then I'm gonna be done unless people have questions. And um, the raffle would be, um, giving two free copies of one of our packages. It's $600 worth in value, and this is gonna help you get ready for the Amazon interview and a bunch of other companies' interviews as well. And, um, and you're very lucky to be Northeastern students to be here, because the only thing you need to do is um, to be present by, at the end of this event, and Professor Puffer is gonna figure out how we transact the raffle. But um, yeah, two of you are gonna get this if you'd like and hopefully that was gonna be helpful to you. So if you wanna get a hold of me, <laughs> there's another picture. Anyway, if you wanna get a hold of me, this is uh, my uh, website, our website I should say, we, we have a team of me and five other people and the uh, email address is hello at amazonbound.today. Thank you, questions? Uh, first of all, we're going to hold the questions for a moment, but we are not going to hold our applause. Please, uh, give it up for Nick Dimitrov. He's, uh, uh, he's very generous. I said he's a very generous person with his time and with his products here. And so uh, hang in there for the, uh, until the end of the day because this is, these are two very valuable um, awards that Nick is providing us. Now, you know that Nick was my student. That was very moving about Conte Partiro. It's really meaningful to me. Yes, we did play music, international music in the course. And what was the name of the course? Nick, I'm putting you on the spot. I think it was International Business or Human Relations. Human That's resources. a fail. He oh, just failed. I'm so sorry. It was on me. a terrible fail. <laughs> oh my. Was it International Finance? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what well, as my, as my grandmother used to say, education is what's left with you once you've forgotten everything else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it was a, a while ago, but I happen to remember the name of the course, but you seem to need a little help. I do. Uh, would you, and since you're my student, I'm going to put you to work still. Of course. Go to the next slide, please. I, I, I saw it and I chuckled. <laughs> there is Nick with a little girl that, that I know very well, who at the time was eight years old. Nick, is, that's my daughter, Carol. And uh, now Nick has a son, may I say his name? Mason, who is seven years old. Yes. So, you know, we're, we're just kind of, life repeats itself. Look what you're wearing. That should help you refresh your memory as to the name of the course. What are you wearing there, Nick? One class. Uh, this T-shirt was Nick's idea. Oh. Yes. Totally forgotten. <laughs> Nick, uh, Nick was a very creative and incredibly engaging person in the class, as you can well see. He has not lost any of that. And he said, this is su uh, such an awesome group of people. Uh, what did we say? 20 students. That we should have a T-shirt 
to, because we come from 23 countries. Figure that out. You're the multicultural people, right? 20 students, 23 countries. And he even threw in the maple leaf for me uh, coming from Canada. Well, Nick, go to the next slide, please. Was he just out of laundry? He was just out of laundry. I had, yep, and he couldn't figure, that was before he figured out the washing machine coin. All right, this is a, I've hosted, as I'm sure many of you faculty members and staff have, lots and lots of parties at my home. And uh, it's one of the most gratifying uh, things about uh, being a faculty member. So we had, you know, a six foot long sub, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the students. And of course, my daughter is in the picture all the time. Next one, please. Next one. So I got inspired at the time by Nick's t-shirt, and I came up with a cake with uh, all the flags and Cross-cultural management was Cross the name management. of the course, all right? Being so corrected. There you are. <laughs> well, I think you need a little help. Um, but first of all, I'm going to put my daughter back on, please, Carol. And I hope she's watching right now. Um, <clears throat> when I was looking for these photos for you, uh, I came across some of, you know how you keep your kids' uh, schoolwork. This is Carol um, when she was... Um, in, uh, when she was 10. And she, uh, her, her teacher had her, this was the writing assignment. Dear Miss Quinlan, being different is sometimes very hard. Being different can make you unique in many amazing ways. I believe that everyone is different in unique ways, but we have many things in common. I have met many people that are different different races and different cultures. I know Madeline E., who is part Native American. I also know some of my parents' Russian friends um, uh, that really have great Russian culture. To feel good about my own differences, I show them and don't hide them. I think maybe someone will think something different than that. Uh, or. Um, maybe someone will think something different that I do is really funky. Uh, a 10-year-old kid here. Uh, to accept other different, others' differences, I just remember that everyone is a different person deep inside. And I should respect everything, even if I don't practice or do the same things as that person. Differences are so great to have in a friendship. It makes it so exciting. It's been an exciting experience coming back, cycling back with Nick after over 20 years. And I have a little something for you, Nick. It was a keeper. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Nick. Now uh, we have time for Thank about you. five minutes of questions that I would imagine you will, everybody wants to have a chat with Nick here. Remember, don't be shy here. Oh, Professor Swayze, you shy. need the microphone. Sir. No, 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 it's okay. you can hear me. no, 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 no for, the, for, the, for the folks at home. I just try to talk loud. That, anyhow. Hi, uh, Rick Swayze, finance faculty. When I do resume slams and whatnot for students, I, I tell them to emphasize uh, detail in the personals line. Okay. In case that they can uh, set a hook with the interviewer, they've got something in common before Great you point. know it. The, the person is talking to you like a colleague and not somebody who's just looking for a job. Do, do, do you think that still applies or is that, is, that, is that too much, is that sort of old school? No, I I 100% I, I, I think it applies. There's there's the way I see it in the in the about me section. There's no downside. If you list a bunch of things that are irrelevant to the person, then they just roll their eyes. But you can really connect with them, as you said. So that that's very very helpful. They they need to provide a bunch of detail in the professional side as well, but personal is just as good. Okay, if I use you as a reference, Absolutely. that that's that's even better. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Swayze. Let's get another question or a comment. How did you feel about Nick's talk here? Everybody want to be Sir, an Amazon man? In the back. All right. Why don't you come on up here, thanks, so we can just uh, see you a little bit better and 
and uh, get your question. Okay. Here. Yep. Hi, Nick. Um, so, uh, uh, so my name is Tang. Uh, I come from Vietnam. I'm currently a fourth year student studying finance. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Ms. Professor Swayze invited me to this event today because he, he thought that my own personal experience would be very helpful um, to like help other students who go through the same struggles as like an international student. And I myself may be able to you know, learn from experiences um, from people like Nick and from other people in this room who might be able to, you know, to share like meaningful experiences that will be very helpful for me uh, going forward. So yeah, um, thank you, Nick, for all of your sharing. Um, the question that I have is, um, you know, obviously you provided us with a lot of, um, you know, technical um, preparation for interviews, but for my own personal experience, um, like I have a lot of struggles getting that interview, and I think it would be very important for you to, you know, provide us with some tips on how to, you know, get that interview offer from like these like big firms because obviously we came here with no network whatsoever um, and no connections. So yeah. Dang, thank you. That's a great question, and um, that feeds into Professor Swayze's earlier question as well. So, so there's good news and bad news. So, uh, so let's start with uh, I don't know. Let's start with the bad news, and then and then end with the good news. The, the bad news is that resumes are not the way to stand out, because particularly for a lot of these large companies, they have so many resumes in in their in their systems that it, it's impossible to stand out. What they do with the resume is they OCR it, they scan it, they upload, they remove all formatting. So don't waste any time on bolding or whatever or underlining, they remove all formatting, they upload it into their digital systems, into an S3 bucket online or an Azure bucket online, and then they highlight it for index words. And then the next time a recruiter or a hiring manager is looking for a role, they highlight a bunch of, uh, a bunch of in key index words and see who comes back. So it's virtually impossible to stand out based on a resume alone. Uh, you're gonna be one of many. Now it can be, you can have such unique skill that the indexation is going to bring you as the one result only, but that's very unlikely. So, so that's the bad news. The good news is you're not at any disadvantage with regard to the resume compared to the domestic students. Um, so that's the good news. So now what do you do in order to stand out? What you do is you build your network. As uh, Professor Ivy mentioned earlier, You've got to build your network. A lot of these companies, they hire as many as 60, 70% of their employees based on referrals. And they actually reward their employees to refer people internally. And if you stay employed with a company for three months or six months, that person is gonna get paid money for, your, for you being a successful hire for the company. So how do you do that? The, again, good news, bad news. The bad news is you don't do it overnight. It's not something that you can just brute force. You have to invest in it. And if you're here for a year as an international uh, uh, master's student, that's plenty of time. You have to start cultivating that network of yours. Use your northeastern.edu address. It's an incredible asset. Reach out to companies, as Professor Ivy said. Offer to give them value. Offer, you know, offer to meet up with them. Uh, build those LinkedIn connections. And I would literally Highlight not companies that you want to apply to, but first highlight people who work at those companies that you want to have first degree connections on LinkedIn with. That's incredibly important. And, and, and I would say in the span of one, two, three months, you can actually show this person what you're made of. You can visit them in person if they're in the Boston area. If you want to work for a banking company, I know banks are big in Boston, go absolutely see them in person. If you want to work for somebody on the West Coast, do it digitally, do it with Zoom. Zoom's a wonderful technology. And, uh, and, and build that connection, build that rapport. Don't, be, don't hold yourself back if, you, if this person has not worked with you directly. That's not a deal breaker. A lot of these companies, they have a bifurcated referral system. They can say, yes, I worked with Tang as, as, uh, as my direct report, or I've not worked with Tang, but I think he's going to be a good Amazonian, a good Googler, a good Facebook employee. They have... Um, uh, an industry referral or a direct referral. And they get paid no matter what. 
So build those connections. It takes months, but once you've built it, it stays with you because this person, you know, these companies, they tend to poach people from one company to another. So wherever else that person goes, they will, be, uh, they will vouch for you. Um, so start working on this now and uh, hope it's gonna pay off three or six months from now. Yeah, that's, that's like an awesome um, answer. Um, I'm getting to that as well. Um, and I do hope that like the audience, um, you know, by listening to your advice, will get started on it. Um, what I realize is the earlier you start, um, the better for you um, going forward. So yep. thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Tang. As you can see, there are lots of, uh, lots of benefits from um, networking with Nick. Hey, network with Nick. How about that? A new slogan. I see a couple of questions. Let's make it, uh, uh, you know, we're going to have to move to the next sec session, and Professor Ivy is going to be setting us up, and we have our, our uh, Zoom visitors coming to be in their groups. So we'll hold further questions, but thank you. I'm glad you're so interested. And once again, let's give a great round of applause to Nick Dimitra. So I hope, uh, I hope I, our participants who are uh, uh, with us from remote locations around the world are still looking forward to this session that is coming up. And it will not be recorded in the room, as I said earlier. We will be coming back at 3 o'clock with, with our panel discussion and then our closing words after that. Um, the conference will close at 4.30 at Bo uh, Boston time. Uh, uh, please go to the Zoom link, those of you who are attending remotely, and we have set up breakout rooms where your facilitator's name for the session will be, will be the name of the breakout room. Uh, some people have been pre-assigned, and they will go to that particular facilitator. Others, if you have not been pre-assigned to a room, then you will be free to go to uh, um, any breakout room you choose that uh, let's try to even out the number of people in each breakout room, all right? And uh, there will be plenty of instructions and guidance. And Professor Ivy guarantees us that not only is this going to be a valuable interactive experience about enhancing your employability, but it's going to be fun. And we're going to network, all right? And so we'll... Um, we'll get that started at 1.30 in five minutes, and we'll do a little rearranging of the tables here. Professor Ivy has something to say at the moment. Just one moment. While everybody has a, have a break, Dr. Puffer and Nick have a picture to make. Oh, but no, we'll do it later. We'll Look do at this. Later. Oh, okay. <laughs> the talk is gone. Oh. Okay, break then. All right, we will... Uh, we will go to the Zoom links starting in a couple of minutes, and then please come back to the live webcast at uh, 3 p.m. Boston time. Enjoy yourselves, folks, and get to know one another. <laughs>